YouTubers. Thank you very much for the invitation. Also, Pierre, we already had very interesting talks in uh, before in preparing this contribution. Um, I'm really happy to contribute to this um, event, this series of events, because it's yeah, I think it's a, a starting point of a movement that you are working on and that you are all involved in. Um, I very much like um, the, the, the title, also the um, idea of reimagining timber uh, and um, how I can contribute to this um, topic. Um, maybe I can start with sharing my screen. I think this is still yours here. Yeah. So that should work. Um, is this, which, which do you see? No, this is perfect. Thank you. Do you see my slides? Yes, perfect. Yeah. Uh, okay, because I don't know if you see this. Okay, okay, great. Um, Give me a second. Yeah, as you as you might, might expect, I'm approaching the topic from a very uh, different perspective. I'm starting not with the material uh, wood uh, or timber. I'm starting for sure from the perspective of the tree as a growing organism. Um, and as you also all know, trees grow very slow. Timber production is quite a fast business and building with timber also is known to be faster than other um, ways of building but if we include in our perspective the whole production of wood of timber we are speaking of decades you can see here um, a tree growing about 200 years this is a city tree for example um, and maybe after some decades, 50, 60, or even just 100 years, he might have, with the tree, it might have reached a size that we are expecting from a tree. And then it is not old at all. And normally when trees are 80 to 200 years, we are about to harvest them for timber production. In the field of biobotanic, we are not only interested in the timber in terms of a living construction material, but also in the tree as a living organism that is performing environmentally. So we all know what forests are doing and how they are contributing beneficially to air quality, to water cycles, to biodiversity. And with the idea of biobotanic, we also tr try to let the tree, keep the tree alive to also import this into architecture. But we also import by this the growth speed of the whole tree. And if we now compare the, the speed of architecture and the speed of urban development with the tree, we can do this here in this slide. We can see that in such 200 years of a tree growth, our urban environment might change drastically. So um, when this tree that is now 200 or 220 years old um, uh, was uh, starting to grow, we are at the end of the 18th century, our cities looked completely different. And when it is 100 years old, we are in the 19th century, a very traditional European city now have re have May, might have grown to a level um, that is already industrial, that we have... Um, railways that we have uh, extensions of the urban fabric and now at the end of the 20s or the beginning of the 21st century we also see all this urban sprawl around and the tree this original tree might stay, stand somewhere and has witnessed all this as i'm teaching also in landscape architecture i would like to exemplify that before i go more into constructing with trees um, in more details with some cities um, I'm at first focusing on trees in a very famous European green project that is dealing with trees from the 19th century, the so-called Wiener Ringstraße, a green belt planted in Vienna in the 19th uh, century, where trees were planted for many reasons, to provide shade for the horses that were walking running there and um, they were walking on sandwalks and this shouldn't be dusty so it shouldn't dry out so 
shade was needed. There are women that shouldn't become tanned in the face, so they needed shade. And there's also horses for transportation um, that should stay fit and should not uh, starve in the sun, so also they needed shade. These were the functional arguments for planting trees in the city. But none of them worked in the beginning because for sure the trees planted were super small and the sh shade was minimal. Until now, these trees have grown very well, very large. Um, they fulfill all this function, but all this social fabric, all the environment has completely changed. No horses anymore, cars, tram stations, um, as trains, and so on, bicycles, um, and uh, completely different expectations. But still, they serve very well, well in terms of what we are expecting today from such a tree lane. Second example, even more known, the Central Park in New York, full of trees in a very dense urban environment. Um, if we look at the original plan, um, we, um, one of the idea of the landscape architect behind this was to plant high growing trees in the periphery of the park to hide away the city. That trees that grow so high that we can't see the buildings that we really feel like in an English landscape or in an, in an English landscape garden. For sure, in the beginning, that didn't work because the trees were small and the city was already there, but not that large as we know it. Again, the trees grew very well, but we all know that the city grew much faster and also much higher. Um, and we can see the city from almost all points in Central Park. Um, so what is this telling us? It is telling us that in principle, in, when we look into the whole life of wood, so to say, the whole life of a tree, um, we have two very different worlds. We have the world of the tree here on the right that grows super slow and also in some kind of unexpected manner. We can't forecast it in detail and we need a lot of patience. And on the left side, we have the technical world of our construction sites, of our building industry, which is comparably really fast. It is relatively exactly planned. Um, um, and it is also very much concentrating material at a certain point. The trees, they only live on the sun and on the CO2 of the air and of the water. These are all the limiting factors that is also slowing down um, the process of growth that depends solely on photosynthesis. Um, but they bring a lot of benefits that we do not have in normal built in environment. I think these images make it really clear. When we look at this very dense concrete city, we have urban heat islands, we have only minimal biodiversity, we have problems with water runoff and things like that. And all this is the forest is mitigating and the problems are solved by the trees. And here comes the idea of Balbotanic into play, where we simply say, um, let's not only use the tree as a material for building, let's build with the tree, let's integrate living trees in our built environment in various ways to also benefit from all this um, um, ecological benefits a tree brings into our environment. Maybe before I continue, um, I just want to uh, say that um, if you have any questions in between, please don't uh, hesitate to ask them directly switching on your microphone um, or putting uh, um, something in the chat, a comment or question that we can relate to at the end of my talk. So let's continue. I would like to exemplify this um, at first before I come to uh, our current uh, projects and also research uh, on, on um, developments. I would like to exemplify this with um, our research on a very impressive historic example we are working on since roughly four years out now. This is the 
living root bridges of the Kazi people in India, for me, one day of the out, most outstanding examples of architecture made of living wood. Very shortly for your orientation, where we are when I speak about the Kazi people in India, we are in the far northeast of India, um, in the Meghalaya mountains, very steep mountains, um, where these amazing structures are built by a collaboration, I would say, between humans and a tree over a long period of time. This is a very, very unique space. It's a subtropical climate, and it's a very, very hilly area. It goes up from almost sea level to around 2,600 meters, very steep hills and valleys. And it is known as the wettest place on Earth. Um, in the rainy season, with around 600 to 800 millimeters of rain per week. This is what we have in a year. And all this water is rushing down um, these canyons um, where the rivers become very, very strong and dangerous. And people need to become very inventive to cross this, um, especially because tra traditional wooden material is decaying quite fast um, and is very labor intensive to, to make and very difficult to make in this subtropical climate. And this is how then the idea and the culture of living architecture in this region emerged. How are such bridges then started to be built or let's say grown? This starts not with a construction, this starts with the act of planting, of planting a ficus tree. It is ficus elastica in this case, a strain fig trees. Planting normally just on one side of the river, a ficus tree that grows there for roughly 10 to 15 years, until it starts to produce so-called aerial roots that sprout out of the side branches. And then construction starts of a temporary structure, sometimes a bamboo bridge that is already usable, to guide these roots, these very thin aerial roots, from the one side of the river to the other side of the river, along such temporary structures as you can see here in this example. During this process, these roots are woven together and they are knotted together very often in a network-like structure, a very fragile structure, as you can see here on that image. These roots are very sp special in a way. They only grow in length in the beginning. I will come to the different growth processes in a minute. And only once they have reached the other side, and when they are planted into the ground there, they, they branch out in the ground, they take up the water and the nutrition from the soil there. And this is the kind of the trigger that they suddenly produce tension wood all along. They, by this, they are tightened, they are pressed on each other, and then they start to grow in circumference, in thickness. And with this, two processes are started. You can already see that here in the details. And by the growth in, of, in thickness, they start to merge. We say they inosculate. They um, are kind of welded together by biological processes. I will also come to this in a minute. And they grow stronger over time, they grow some circumference. Replacing the original temporary structure, you see here the rotting bamboo. And by the overall growth becoming stronger and stronger over time, the wood itself for sure being protected as in a living tree, which this is, by the bark outside, and also um, growing, adapting, and changing all over creating such structures as this very famous uh, double-decker bridge in Nongriat, um, which is some of the most outstanding examples um, as real elements of traffic infrastructure, not car traffic for sure, pedestrian traffic, but essential part of the social system of um, connecting villages there, um, part of the um, 
traffic system, as I had said already. So this is one of the more oldest example that we know. It's more on the plateau already up the hill, um, connecting two villages. Here I would like to refer a bit to our research um, that we have done on that. Um, we have starting to, to um, visit and to document more or less all these bridges. Uh, this was mainly done by uh, my PhD student, Wilfred Middleton. And we tried to at first group them in three classes of ages. On the left, you can see a young bridge. Young is relative. This bridge is about 60 years old. And this a class of age we defined as a bridge started by a person that still lives. So maximum like 70 years old or so. In the middle, we, this, we are referring here to the upper deck. Um, these are bridges that have been started to, to build by people that are no, have been known by people that still live now. So ancestors, so grandfathers, for example, that adds up to maybe 150 years. And then we just can say bridges older than that. We don't know how old. There's no proof about that. It probably is several hundred years, 300, 400, or even more. We don't, um, we can't judge that at the moment. Um, what we also did in our inventory was uh, trying to understand the morphology of the roots, which is super interesting because um, these uh, air will um, adapt definitely to their orientation, maybe also to their to the loading regime, which we couldn't uh, um, prove yet, but what they definitely do, they react to the, their orientation. The more horizontal they are oriented, the more they grow like elliptical or even like what we call the inverted T form, um, that they grow stronger down here and then li like a slab in a way, which is very beneficial um, for bending moments for sure. So they are kind of self-optimizing and the Kasi people know this very well from their traditional tacit knowledge and they are dealing with this in a very synergetic way when they are not only designing and building but also maintaining and developing their bridge. This is uh, the map we had made about that. This is 74 of the bridges. Um, um, the colors you can see here um, um, refer to the different maintenance regime. So it is if it is an individual or a family or a village community um, that is maintaining these bridges, which is an important aspect because it is a permanent process um, where you always have to invest labor. You have to invest care. You have to look for these bridges. And um, you also, um, it ties together the... Um, the uh, communities in a way, families, but also whole villages and also connects some villages that work together on one bridge, for example. So it's very important to also see the social aspect of this form of living wooden architecture. We are investigating this in our research, but also with our students in our seminars, for example, by classical 2D drawings or also by 3D reconstructions, um, 3D drawings, but this is still a 2D investigation, let's say, by physical models, very um, laborious models out of um, a, a lot of uh, individual wires where we are also trying to represent the process of making, but also by 3D scans, um, which especially Wilfred is doing in his research. Um, and I would like just like to show you some examples at the moment we have scanned around six of these uh, bridges with photogrammetry, very, very basic um, technology, um, to get a more deep understanding and also in order to reconstruct um, the structural system, but also the physiological systems that we can understand where are the, how are the forces distributed, but also how, for example, is the water transport happening in such living wooden complex structures. This being said, I think uh, I would like now to come to more, let's say, botanical basics of um, bio botanic of constructing 
with trees. And uh, I have put this in brackets because we are also, let's say, constructing the tree itself. We'll understand this in a second. Um, first, I would like to go through the emergence of a tree. You see a one-year-old sapling here. Um, and here you, I can exemplify very well some uh, key aspects of uh, the emergence of a tree, of tree growth, also of the production of wood, if you want so. We have uh, different forms of growth. We have the growth in length, we have the growth in diameter, and we have the growth in branching. So this is the first unbranched shoot, relatively slender and thin. And in the next year, the buds sprout out and we have the first level of branching um, and we have additional growth in length at the main shoot and at the same time the growth in thickness as at the lower parts start you can see how the trunk slowly becomes thicker the interesting fact i would like to highlight here is that after this one year shoot growth at the tip always growth in length is finished at that part. So if when you are here, where my mouse here is, uh, and you continue with the growth, the, these points do not move up anymore. What is happening at the same time is that the lower branches that are shaded, for example, that are not that efficient in photosynthesis anymore, are dying and shed away. And by this, the canopy is moving up, but not by the wood being stretched in a way. This is very important to understand um, because this allows us to construct with the tree as a linear element that is not deforming the geometry of the living wooden construction. But you can also see with these dotted lines that represent the dying branches that the death of elements, uh, the dying of elements is an integral part of the growth of a tree. Without elements dying and being shed away, no tree, no tree would grow and survive at all. So death is always part of the life of a tree. And trees are not only just growing, they are very efficiently adapting to their environment simply because they do not have any chance to move like animals. They are grounded with their roots and they need to get along with um, their environmental conditions. And they need also to get along with changes and destruction of, um, for example, the loss of animals, breaking branches by the wind and so on. And that's why they um, invented by evolution, so to say, um, the regrowth of elements that you know this all, when you cut off a branch, a new branch can come out here or at another point. But um, it could even grow out of a root if there are good conditions for this. And the same is for roots. When you cut a root, new roots will sprout out. And if roots, for example, uh, it, if branches, for example, are touching the ground, also new roots are spreading out. And this can, in some cases, also happen from the branches. And here now we are at this very special point of the ficus elastica, which I had explained for the living root bridges, where um, normally these um, aerial roots sprout out of older branches, which normally support in a vertical way the trunk and the branch, but can be guided in very different directions as well. When elements are lost, for example, cut away or broken away, um, the wood is exposed and bacteria that cause, for example, decay can enter. So when we speak about conventional wood construction, we always have a kind of a damaged trunk because we cut through the wood, we cut through the bark that in the living organism is protecting the wood from decay, etc. What is happening in the living wood construction is that we have wound healing, that the tree is trying to close this injury with um, the sealing of bark layer, that no more bacteria, no more ox oxygen can penetrate into the wood that it gets rotten. 
So it's encapsulating this injury. It cannot in directly heal it, but it can prevent from more damage that could happen. And also the wood in, inside is restructured in a way that decay cannot spread so fast. Also biological um, process that we do not have with not living wood. Here you can see this in a detail how the round is closed from the outside. And this process of local adaptation of growth in circumference, which in, prin in principle is this round healing, it is also a special tissue, the callus tissue, um, can also happen when trees come in contact with non-living elements. For example, like a stone, which is very natural in the soil for sure, where we have dozens and hundreds of stones where the trees are always in touch with. And by overgrowing these they in the, in the ground, they even stabilize themselves and they anchor themselves in the ground. So this is an essential process. And sometimes this also happens by accident um, above ground. For example, when a fence is very close to the tree or a pipe, as you can see here, and then step by step, this is overgrown by the tree and incorporated in a kind of a form fit. And in the Bau Botanic approach, we try to use this to create such form fits to generate hybrid structures that have living wooded elements and non-living technical elements like this stainless steel handrail you can see here in this quite old project from us, from the Bau Botanic footprint from 2005. Um, and there's another very, very um, inspiring process that I have already introduced with the living root bridges, the process of inosculation, which happens simply when two living elements like two branches or two trunks or two roots are touching each other and more or less firmly are pressed on each other, depending on the species. On the species. And what is happening then that at, at first the tissues of the bark are merging. And once this has happened, um, the tissues of the wood are growing through the joint bark tissues and also are also merging, forming a common growth ring. And by this forming one body of wood, which is a strong junction. It's, a, it's one, one continuous ring of wood, which um, Physi uh, physically is very strong, but also allows uh, physiologically the um, exchange of water, of nutrition, um, of um, also of the photosynthesis products of uh, sugar from one tree to the other. Because now we can speak not only not about two individuals here, but on one that have merged. Here you can see different examples that have been done by us over the last years with many different species. And on the left, you can see some serial cuttings with different stages of development of um, this in osculation only around for one or two years. What, how this is happening this year with the London plane tree. These are cochlear processes for designing and constructing and engineering with living trees. And we are investigating this in more detail. Um, we have uh, plantations of dozens and hundreds of these in osculations where we time by time are harvesting and also doing mechanical tests. What we are doing here, we are comparing um, the inner structure um, on a macroscopic level of let's say 10 year old um, in osculations on the left and on similarly aged branch junctions. And you can see that our artificially formed tree connection is very, very similar to the naturally grown branch junction. Here, this is about uh, eight centimeters up the joint and this is more inside 40 centimeter above the, the joint. Again, we can see very, very, similar patterns of um, anatomy, of wood anatomy, where uh, the wood is really in the middle pressed away and then joining. And I would like to exemplify this um, on some micro CT scans. Um, our colleagues at the 
plant biomechanics group in Freiburg have done, um, where we are we're cutting the such inosculations into two by two centimeter blocks and then scanning three dimensionally to understand what is really happening inside the wood. Um, and what you can see when you make horizontal and vertical sections here, you can uh, see um, that you have very, very interesting patterns of joining tissues that are like really intertwining. And, and they are doing this in a very similar way in branch junctions um, uh, as in our artificially constructed joints. This being said, I would like to zoom out again a little bit. And I would like to come back to the comparison between the world of tree growth and the world of construction I have already um, started with in the beginning of the lecture. On the right hand, we have again the tree that has been grown in this case for roughly 20 years as one entity on a cellular level based on photosynthesis. And on the left, you see a manzanary wall that is created of dozens of individual elements that are put one on top of the other. And this very simple additive process is the trick to make buildings so fast, no matter if we are doing um, novel ways of additive manufacturing, 3D printing, or if we just make bricklaying, or if we make timber construction. We always add elements to each other in a technical process. And by this, we can speed up quite a lot. A, tr a normal tree can't do that. It depends on its inner processes. In my research, I asked myself always, why can't we fuse these very different ways of thinking? Can't we use, can't we try to use uh, young living trees as individual elements like the brick layer is using the brick and merge them into a bigger, more complex structure immediately? This we um, have explored very early in this sketch to put one tree on top of each other, only the lower putting in the ground, while others planting in pots and connecting all them in a way that they are all connected to this network-like structure and all merge into one organism that they can share water and all um, processes. Um, and by doing so, the trees, is what the high processes will grow the best in the ground and the others become obsolete in the future and all these pots can be cut away so you have then constructed a tree um, in an artificial way that is as resilient as and self-supporting and maybe even stronger than a naturally grown tree this was the idea behind that approach and we had tested this out in a series of experiments. What you can see here is a test field where we have these lower trees and upper trees in pots. And this is always the same species here. And um, they are then connected just with a very simple screw connection to uh, create an inosculation at that point um, to become one unit and one entity. And to prove that, we have then, here you can at first see some other examples with other species. What we have then simply done is we have cut away the upper tree root to prove if the water is coming from this lower tree into the upper tree. And this is more a qualitative study at first, but what you can see here several weeks after we have done this with most of the trees, you can see them all very lively. And by this, we could prove that we really can construct the tree in a vertical way um, to create new like hyper organisms um, in a much stronger and faster way than the natural growth process is normally doing it. But still, it is a process and it is a long-term process that needs to be managed over time. This approach was the basis for several test buildings we have done with um, our Bau Botanic work and research group and my office collaboration in the last 10 years around. Um, one of the, them and the biggest one is the plane tree cube um, we have started to build on in 2012 in South Germany in Nagold which is this building, which is using this um, construction principle 
connecting more than 1,000 trees, the majority in the beginning in pots and only the lower ones in the ground, to become a self-supporting load-bearing structure that is the main element of this three-story building that can support visitors on three levels in the future. Here you can see the process of pre-cultivation of these trees, pre-connection and also installation on this partly temporary scaffolding. And you can see impressions of the first year. Um, and you can see the section in the first year. You can see um, a detail of the elevation in the first year. And you can see then what we have done, in this case, this is a photo from another project, um, in the connection of the element and also um, in cutting away the upper tree pots um, to create, in the end, a solid wooden structure that is able to be joined with these metal elements that stay inside. The majority of the metal elements, the steel elements, is, uh, will be removed. And um, that is then supporting also the people inside. And spatially, what is changing is that we have like more green walls in the beginning, but we are approaching a living tree canopy, which is then creating the space and it's also closing it to the sky. Um, this is more or less the situation as we have started. Um, these young plants in all these spots, temporary construction. And this was in an area of a gardening show, which was the starting point of an um, urban development. And in the beginning, when it started 10 years ago, the, the surrounding was very green. Um, there were quite some old trees and there were um, some small houses. And this is more or less the change over the last 10 years. The trees grew stronger. Some of these pots have been able, we could already remove. Um, quite some trees in the surrounding have been cut and replaced by big buildings. And this is the future outlook where we have a three story living architecture surrounded by a lot of um, traditionally built architecture, um, kind of inverting the, the relations we normally have that uh, buildings are technical and uh, the landscape is green, we really try to also experiment with the opposite image. This is a visualization how it might look in the future when it is all self-supporting. For sure, it will definitely look different in detail. There's not an exact plan how it can look. Um, and this is a student's drawing from a seminar where I asked um, students to speculate over the future on the future of Plenty Cube um, in 150 years. So this is how it might look in around 150 years. We will not be able to prove this because all of us in this Zoom will be dead at that moment. But hopefully this building is still alive. And this is how it is looking more or less now. Um, I think this is already more than one or two years old, so it's even more bigger grown so far. And these are the construction details of these connections. Or this is one of the most developed ones where we already have like 15 centimeter diameter. And step by step, um, it becomes as strong, that, so strong that people start to believe that it could become the main load bearing element. What you can see here, uh, on these vertical steel elements, which are temporary, you see numbers like 2028, 20, a year where we're supposed to remove these steel columns. We do not know if this will hap happen properly. It will happen a bit later because we have some delays. But this is really the idea of this conceptual test building. We, I would not say that this is a prototype. We would like to repeat and repeat again as a load um, viewing structure, but we really want to show what can be done with living wood in our modern environment. What I see is more, let's say, feasible in broad application is a combination of living architecture, of tree constructions that have um, at, they are at least self-supporting or support some 
smaller elements like balconies with technical constructions that could, for example, be timber buildings um, in, in such a way where we try to combine the benefits of both systems. I would like to exemplify this um, on a research project we have done several years ago in Stuttgart, for Stuttgart, um, where we um, suggested different bau botanic approaches to adapt the city to um, the climate change in terms of addressing heat island with maximizing the green volume of the built environment by new bau botanic typologies. And one of these suggestions was to transform one of the streets of a new city quarter that is traditionally planned uh, with these um, building blocks, open building blocks and um, street trees into a green street where um, living trees are constructed as part of the built environment as a tree facade already with the process of building. And we developed different new typologies of architectural um, forms. Um, one is an east-oriented tree facade where we have um, the, um, all this access structure of stairways and corridors outside um, the building, outside this tree structure that forms a secondary layer of facade in between. And then your private flat is hidden away up, up behind this tree. Um, so um, you are feeling like going into a tree house, but you are going into your city flat. And then we have a west-oriented facade where we have living rooms and balconies that are inserted into this tree facade. You can see such a detail and um, also um, some slides that are um, addressing the question if this now is a public or a private tree and who is responsible for the maintenance, which is always a very important point to be solved for such structures. This is a perspective um, outside from inside of such a stru structure looking on this kind of a tree street where um, you, I hope, feel more like in a forest than being in a city. And this is the same street in an autumn situation where you can see that this is all very much changing um, over the season, which is quite a, a, has a lot of advantages because, for example, in the winter you can bring in more sunlight and in the summer you can benefit from the shade and also from the cooling by evapotranspiration. It definitely needs to be coupled with the a clever water system with uh, a blue-green infrastructure where you, for example, use rainwater or as we are investigating in some current research projects, also using grey water, for example, from washing machines um, and showers um, to irrigate the living structure. I would like to... Um, close my lecture at the end with um, um, a student's project um, from the last winter semester, where we try to merge and bring together different approaches we have investigated in the last 10 years, um, bringing together um, our knowledge about the way the Kazi people are building their bridges with our um, digital investigations of this with the 3D scanning and so, and also with our planning strategies and detailing we have developed in this time in between. Um, it was uh, just one semester project to get this started, but it is building on a much older project. It is building on um, a project that had uh, already started back in 2012 by a friend of mine, um, the artist Cornelius Hackenbracht, who um, is um, running an um, art space in South Germany, Neue Kunst am Ried. And he has planted this pavilion 2012 with um, plane trees, Platanos Hispanica, and guiding these trees in kind of a way that they might form a roof, but there was not an exact plan of how that could happen. Um, and um, there was already um, yeah, growth and maintenance in a way of a ping pong between the tree and the builder. Um, 
But um, we tried to answer with this project several research questions. We really wanted to explore here how we could directly really co-design with the tree that we react on the actions of a tree and create an interaction by reacting on the existing growth um, and not adapting so much the tree to our technical forms and structures, but adapting our technical systems to the tree growth. And um, this not seeing as an end point, but just seeing as a starting point for a future co-creation process that will have more and more interventions over time. Our studio started um, with um, a site visit, sadly without the students, because it was uh, last November where we had lockdown. So um, we were fully depending on our um, technical means, on our digital tools to create a um, coherent 3D scan. We used um, our experiences from scanning the living root bridges with photogrammetry. So simply flying over the whole thing with a drone and taking a lot of photos and then creating a point cloud out of this, the whole uh, plot, but especially for sure of the living structure. As you can see here, the point cloud of the main trunks and the main branches that was then simplified to go out into this much more simple 3D model you can see down um, right and also this Excel model top right and then different branches was uh, got a priority as main trunks, as secondary trunks and also as trunks that might or, or branches that are not essential for the structure that might be removed. And the idea was to use this very heterogeneous and complex trunk and branch geometry as a design driver to design a technical roof that is not only supported by these trees, but is completely integrated with these trees. So what um, the group of students um, then did is explored in a long-term process over the whole semester, which I would quickly like to explain also the didactic approach we are using. We start always as, uh, as usual with a conceptual phase. In, we, started in, we start with three dreams normally um, that are in kind of a competition for searching for the best concept. Um, and in, after the first presentation, we um, kick out one concept and we focus on two concepts and we create two groups. And then after the second presentation, we kick out the second approach and we or we merge them very often also to just one final proposal where then the whole group is working to bring it to life to bring it to reality at the same time we are also teaching the necessary tools and have some intermediate results so it's a very dense semester um, but um, here are kind of the conceptual results so the winning concept was this approach to guide the branches to um, the middle of a roof and to simply put a shingle roof over these growing trees and over this shingle roof, the canopy then will come out over time. And um, in this interims area here, we have a hybrid structure, the main load bearing system by the tree branches kind of harmonized and moderated by a technical structure that holds the, the the skin of the of the roof, so to say, um, and the form of this structure in between the wood and the skin of the roof was directly derived from the geometry of the branches, um, and was translated in a very into a very very complex three D framework which was realized as a very simple steel, only, only eight millimeter steel rods. Um, as you can see in these slides, this was this just mediating structure in between, which is the, the key technical part, which was designed in these 14 elements for construction and transportation reasons. 
and which was then in the semester break completely produced by our students in our um, one by one design factory at TUM, which is a great institution we have now. Um, we have uh, the students had to learn welding for that and were welding these main um, elements, but also were connecting them to this total structure in, in the end with a very laborious process in around several weeks of time. Then painting it against corrosion, bringing it to the construction site where the trees were waiting for this and constructing it into the tree. This is for me a fascinating image. Um, this is one a, a member of my chair. Um, and um, this is Nico who is climbing on the structure at that point, um, connecting the, the technical elements, very light technical elements with each other that together with these trees um, form then this roof. The roof is not closed yet. And um, what we can also see here is that the whole thing already is fully loading on the trees. There's no foundation. There's no platform, no concrete slab or something which would give us orientation. We are really like playing in the air, playing in the branch structure. Um, the only orientation is coming from the geometry of the trees themselves. This is the finalized structure. And here you already can see how this ping pong for us between building and growing works. We now have finished one phase again and the trees with the leaves, you can see that come out again, starts to regrow. And here you can see how this has happened over this last year. Um, and in the next winter, when they have become a bit stronger and had have adapted to this um, special conditions and also to this new way of uh, direction of growth we will start with um the skin of the of of the roof and we might close it step by step probably uh, with more um stability arising we will also add more um closed surface and by this more load so we are really reacting also to the performance of the trees with our action um, we have made some forecasts with different scenarios. We are always thinking in long-term development. So this is just 30 years. Which hopefully it will last much longer and will grow stronger much longer. And the, um, it will look very different depending on how intense the pruning is taking place and um, also how strong the growth is. We can only make forecasts. Forecasts are very important and we are investing a lot of research into how we could forecast the growth but we also know that this is the more it comes into the far future the more blurry it becomes like with the weather forecast and we have to think in scenarios here because also we cannot predict the weather and climate conditions in detail what is going on at the moment is um, the next steps of this um, this is um, a conceptual diagram of um, a project that is funded by the Ober Arup Foundation, um, where we are standing here at the moment. Um, this is what we have done so far. And at the moment, we are preparing the next semester with a studio that will bring back this knowledge and experience of how to treat living wood, um, also with technical means back to India, back to Meghalaya, where the people that have been growing the living witches are that have been going for hundreds of years to fuse these different approaches um, and then inviting these people also to join us um, to bring this joint knowledge um, into dense built urban environments in mega cities, Hong Kong or Shanghai or Singapore, for example, uh, to create new forms of urban green that are at the same time living wooden structures. This is the end of my lecture. Thank you very much uh, for listening. Um, and I um, hope that I didn't take up too much time and um, that we now have left some times for more questions.